Thank you for attending this webinar sponsored by NEC Corporation. To learn more about the Programmable Flow Networking Suite featured in these use cases, please contact your NEC account rep today or go to NEC Corporation of America's website at www.necam.com sdn. To find additional SDN, OpenFlow, and Network Function Virtualization resources, visit ipspace.net slash sdn. Let's move forward to the next use case. This one is, in my opinion, the hello world of OpenFlow because you can deploy it without impacting your production network. You know that in a typical data center network, you collect traffic that needs to be inspected, analyzed, or whatever at a number of points. It can be a span port on a switch, or it could be a hardware tap between two switches or any combination of the two. And then because you don't want to run around the data center with your analyzer, you would always implement some sort of tap aggregation network. And the tap aggregation network would be the bridge between the collection points and the tools that you have deployed somewhere at a central location in the data center so that you can use them and bring any traffic to those points. Ideally, the TAP aggregation network would also perform filtering so that the analysis tools wouldn't be overloaded. And we usually experience a few challenges with the TAP aggregation networks. So let's start with the collection of traffic at the original switches. You know that span operation is usually an all or nothing. So you can mirror an input port to a span port or a number of input ports to a span port. It's pretty hard to mirror only TCP port 80 traffic to a span port. Tap aggregation networks are usually pretty expensive because you buy them from specialized vendors. And those specialized vendors have their own control systems and their own proprietary filtering logic. So you need some control system from that vendor and you apply that filter link logic to those aggregation network switches. It turns out that those switches are behind the scenes nothing else than regular 10 gig switches, sometimes even using merchant silicon. Can we replace them with commodity switches? Of course we can. Instead of using dedicated switches that you would previously use to build the TAP aggregation network, you can deploy OpenFlow enabled switches and then configure the distribution from traffic collected at the different taps or spam ports, do the filtering as soon as possible on the ingress ports, and then also do the traffic distribution on the ingress ports. For example, you could say traffic coming from MAC address B goes to my IDS, and traffic coming from MAC address C goes to my Wireshark, and traffic coming from port 80 goes to this particular one. It's really easy to implement the filtering and forwarding rules with OpenFlow, and in particular, if you use programmable flow, then they have this concept called flow lists, which is really a combination of access control lists and route maps. The flow lists can do pass, drop, or they can do traffic redirection, which is what we need here to forward the traffic to individual appliances. The beauty of this approach is that you can use the REST API of the Framable Flow controller to program these filters. You could, if you wish, log into the controller and use their configuration language to program the flow lists. You can also have your own orchestration system and request that, let's say, traffic from MAC address B be monitored to your Wireshark analyzer, and then your orchestration system would send a REST API call to the OpenFlow controller and the OpenFlow controller would install the forwarding entries into the switches. Finally, when you get to the point that you start deploying OpenFlow enabled switches 
in the forwarding path. Because remember, on the previous slide, we only needed OpenFlow enabled switches in the TAP aggregation network. So this is a really simple deployment where you don't affect the production network at all. You can deploy OpenFlow in this particular use case out of band if you wish. You don't have to touch the production network at all. So no production switches are OpenFlow enabled, which is a nice migration strategy if you're interested in OpenFlow. Whereas at the moment where you have the OpenFlow switches in the forwarding path, the controller can, yet again depending on what the controller supports and what actions it can do and so on, insert forwarding entries into the switches where a particular set of packets that matches whatever criteria would be sent along the forwarding path, so let's say from A to B, but it would also be replicated on a span port or however you want to call that. It's like lawful intercept, if you wish, or like IP multicast or any other traffic replication or flooding mechanism. Only this time it is more precise because you can use the end tuples in the switches to replicate the traffic. What do you gain by doing that? First, you're not mirroring all traffic from here to there, so you can mirror traffic from multiple ports to the same span port without overloading the span port, which also reduces the number of span ports that you need. And you can do this with more or less any OpenFlow controller where you can tell the controller to install individual flows into the switches. So what are the advantages of implementing your tapping and aggregation network with OpenFlow? As I said, first, it's based on commodity switches. Second, you can filter very early in the forwarding path, which means that you don't overload the capturing devices, which means that you can use cheaper capturing devices, so you don't need 10 gig links here. If you collect traffic on 10 gig links, but you actually only have one gig of traffic, you can filter based on almost any packet attribute down to at least TCP port numbers. You can combine this with the previous use case and install flow lists here in the OpenFlow controller, which would then be distributed to the switches, and then monitor how much traffic you are receiving on each redirection entry with flow based metering that I've already mentioned. And Changes to filters and tabs, as I said, are really simple. With programmable flow, you get a few additional goodies. You can use the REST API here. Because the programmable flow network would treat the whole tab aggregation network as a fabric, you get automatic failovers in case of link failures. So programmable flow would automatically adapt to change in topology. And you can build a whole fabric here in the tap aggregation network, so you can easily deploy leaf and spine fabric here to achieve any level of resiliency you wish. Question, how does replacing traditional switches with an open flow enabled switch help in lowering the number of switches required? You see, open flow itself will never reduce the number of switches you need. OpenFlow cannot change the laws of physics, as I said. If you need 10 ports, you need 10 ports. If you need 100 ports, you need 100 ports. If you have one switch with 100 ports, that's it. If you have switches with 30 ports, you need three switches or you need a fabric. OpenFlow cannot help you there. What OpenFlow can do in this particular use case is it can limit the information that's collected so that you don't need as many capturing devices or that you don't need high-speed capturing devices. As for reducing the number of switches, that's not really how I would position OpenFlow. It can do numerous other things, but it cannot reduce the number of ports you need. Will TAP work the same way in path-based forwarding? If we talk about programmable flow implementation, because remember, 
Every vendor does things differently in the OpenFlow world. In the programmable flow implementation with a fabric here in the middle, like I have drawn it, you will definitely have path-based forwarding from ingress to egress port. What other vendors are doing is their own decision and their implementation details, so I cannot comment on what others might be doing. Next one, n-tuple filtering is largely dependent on individual vendor. Not so much on the switch side. On the switch side, the switch vendors would usually reuse existing TCAM. And the existing TCAM in most switches would allow you to filter on source and destination, MAC addresses, IP addresses, and port numbers. So whatever a switch can do, for example, access control list, it can do the same thing through OpenFlow, through the proper n-tuple. Of course, what an individual switch can do, and whether that's done in hardware or whether that particular flow is punted to the CPU and processed there, that is vendor dependent. So you have to check with your particular vendor, number one, what they can match in hardware and what they can match in software. And number two, if we talk about n tuples with n being three, four, five, so let's say full TCP five tuple, then you have to check with your vendor how many five tuples do they support in hardware. Yet again, I know that NEC's edge switches support, if I remember correctly, 100,000 five tuples on the edges and way less than that on the core switches, but on the core switches you don't need that because there you do path-based forwarding. To learn more about the award-winning NEC Programmable Flow Networking Suite or the complete SDN ecosystem NEC is building with partners and how you can customize these use cases for your own networking needs, call your NEC account rep today or go to NEC Corporation of America's website at www.necam.com slash SDN. Thank you for your time and interest in NEC. Additional SDN, OpenFlow, and Network Function Virtualization webinars, recordings, and workshops, as well as other resources like books and case studies, are waiting for you at ipspace.net slash SDN.